Uh, hello, welcome to the Francis Humphrey Lecture Series for um, September. Uh, today we are lucky to have a presentation about the history of downtown Sparks. And just to whet your appetite for next month, I have been working with uh, curator of history emeritus Bob Nyland to create a history of the Nevada State Museum presentation. He is actually going in for hip surgery. So I will be giving the presentation, but it'll all be Bob. Um, because uh, end of October, Nevada Day, is the 80th anniversary of the museum opening to the public. Because we opened to the public on Nevada Day, uh, 1941. So now it's 2021. Okay. But now it's historic sparks time. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Carey. He's a member of the board of the Sparks Heritage Museum. Her is that what it's called? Sparks Heritage Museum. Um, and he is actually the developer of the uh, downtown Sparks walking tour of, you know, historic Sparks, see this building, that building, and the other thing. And he's been doing that for many years. So now we get all of his experience rolled up into one here for the Francis Humphrey Lecture Series. So come on up, smart Scott. And I don't know how you want to do this. I would do it just over your shoulder rather than through your shirt. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. So uh, say hello and I have to answer. Oh, can you hear me? Hi, everybody. Testing, testing. Uh, do a little introduction and I'll Okay. Well, no, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming out tonight. This is uh, a real honor. Um, I've been a member of the Nevada State Museum myself for many years and have been on the other end of these um, Francis Humphrey Lecture Series over the years. So. It's, it's really great to be on this side of it and to share a little history of, of downtown Sparks. Um, I grew a little bit about me. I grew up in Sparks, um, went, to, went to public schools, graduated from Reed High School, and I used the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship to graduate from the University of Nevada. And while I was up at the University of Nevada, I was a geography major, and I took a historic preservation class from, that was taught by uh, Mella Harmon. She was a long time, um, staff member at the State Historic Preservation Office and a really renowned historian, particularly about the, the divorce trade. Um, I think it was my midterm project oh. where I developed this tour of downtown Sparks. Oh, sure. You can hear me a little bit better with that. It's, you never know with these things. It's, it's, this is actually my first presentation in front of live people. I've been doing Zoom for the last year or two, so I'm, I've kind of cut a little bit out of practice. But um, anyway, so this tour is really, or this, this presentation tonight, is really designed to kind of show you about the history of Sparks and how um, the area that I'm going to be focusing on has transitioned from a railroad hub to a um, thriving commercial district to a gaming and tourism destination. And then it kind of went downhill a little bit and, um, and, and was rebirthed with redevelopment and kind of where it's going today. Um, the area that I'm going to be focusing on tonight is this roughly two block area and it's bounded to the east by um, Pyramid Highway, to the south by Interstate 80, to the west by the former Silver Club or now the Nugget Events Center, and to the north by, by C Street. Um, really, the history of Sparks, the city tries to brand itself as it's happening here, and that kind of alludes to the special events that we have throughout the year in Sparks. And really, the history of Sparks, it happened here within what I'm calling the Sparks Historic, historic District. Before I jump in, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the people of the Great Basin and, the, and, and those who have been living in Sparks for a very long time. Um, here in Nevada, we have uh, 27 tribal nations, bands, and colonies all throughout Nevada. They comprise of four different, um, different people. We have around Lake Tahoe and here in Carson City, the Washoe or the Washishu people, 
Um, and that's the blue area in the, in the map here. Um, the tan area, that's the Northern Paiute people out at Pyramid Lake, Stillwater, Fallon, um, down through Walker, Walker Lake as well too. Um, now in Eastern Nevada, the green area, that's the, the Western Shoshone or, the, or the, the Nui as they call themselves. And then down in Southern Nevada, we have the Southern Paiute people. Um, traditionally, the area that we know, now know as Sparks was home to the, the Washoe and the, and, the, and the Northern Paiute people for ever. Um, just to kind of put it, they, they came to this area. It was, a mar it was a little different than it is now. It was a lot more wet. There were a lot of marshlands and, um, and there was a lot more water. But they came to the area to hunt and gather and trade and, 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 were, and were, you know, usually was, was along the, the Truckee River. Just to kind of give you a reference for how long people have been living in the area that we call Sparks in this area in general, um, about 10 years ago out of the Pyramid Lake um, Reservation, there was a study that was done by the University of Colorado where they carbon dated some petroglyphs that were located on the, on the reservation. And through that study, they determined that those petroglyphs were between 11,500 and 15,000 years old. And that's just kind of a mind-boggling stat in my, in my mind, but just to kind of put that into perspective, you know, here, Western civilization, we kind of trace our roots back to ancient Egypt. That's roughly 5,000 years ago. So you go back another 5,000 and then another 5,000. That's how for how long at least people um, have been living in this area. Um, one last point I'd just like to make about the Great Basin people. Um, I think in history, we a lot of the time, we'll, we're, we're a little bit guilty of this. We kind of put up pictures of, you know, black and white pictures of Indians doing something and talk about, hey, that they were. And, and then there, but the point I'd like to make is there's, there's 27 tribes in, in Nevada today. They each have their own history, culture, and, and, and traditions, and, and they're still here. And, and if you're interested in learning more about the Native American experience in, in, in here in Nevada, I'm obviously not the best person to talk about it, but I'd encourage you to walk across the hall when it's open, check out the Under One Sky exhibit. Um, also, the Pyramid Lake Museum out in Nixon, pyramidlake.us is the website for more info. Um, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony Cultural Resources Program um, is another great resource. And of course, the Stewart Indian School Museum here in, in Carson City. Now, before 1902, there really wasn't much in Sparks. It was, um, like I said, it was very, a lot of marshlands and it was just some small farming and, and ranching operations. Um, obviously, people came through the area in, in the California Gold Rust, and the first known settlement in, in what we now know as Sparks Day was called Stone and Gates Crossing, and it was Charles Stone, and, or George Stone and Charles Gates, they established a crossing over the Truckee River, and that was roughly where McCarran Boulevard and Greg Street is, is today, and um, that was the first kind of town in Sparks, and from that kind of grew up the town of Glendale later on. Sparks really got its start was through the railroad. We're the, we're the rail city and the railroad, the first transcontinental railroad came through the area in 1868. And it followed a, a different path than, than it does today. When it came through Sparks, came out of the East Truckee River Canyon and kind of went north along what's now Vista Boulevard and went east-west along what's now Prater Way and, and into 4th Street into Reno. And um, in 1903, the Southern Pacific Railroad made the decision to buy out the Central Pacific Railroad, who were the original builders. And one of the decisions that they made was to straighten the route and just kind of streamline the operations. And what the big, the big decision that they made was to move the railroad operations and the maintenance shops from Wadsworth, which is about 25 miles east of Sparks, and move it to the new town of, of Sparks. And so through that, this is a picture of the construction of the, uh, the maintenance shops, which are still there today by Interstate 80, and also the, uh, the roundhouse as well too and it was really a feat of engineering of its of its day um, the railroad came in they actually raised they did a bunch of grading and they raised the, the elevation of the town site up pretty substantially um, to, to, to put in the, the new town and so um, after the decision was moved the the railroad made made a really generous offer to its employees to help move them to the new town they offered them free land and they also offered them um, the ability the ability to move, to cover the cost of moving their houses and their family along the railroad. And so names were drawn in a hat. There was, there was one hat with family names, and there was another hat with um, lot numbers. 
and the town got together and they picked numbers and everyone got what they got and it was a really um, chaotic or really exciting time. Um, Sparks on July 4th, 1904 was literally picked up from Wadsworth, sorry, was literally picked up, put on the railroad, the houses, the businesses, the churches, the trees, grandma, the dog, you name it, it all went on the railroad and was shipped west and plopped down into the new, into the new town. And so really from that, this is a picture from, from 1904 of, of downtown Sparks. You can see the trolley and the, and the horse, but it was no small feat to really smart, to start a new town. This was just plopping it down in the middle of the desert. And it was a lot of, a lot of effort was, was taken to you know, rebuild these houses. And so the railroad workers, when they weren't working on their shift, they were helping each other build, build their houses. And I think from that, there was a really cool community spirit that, that, was, that was gained from that, that I like to think is still in Sparks today. You know, that neighbor healthy neighbor really developed a small, close-knit community that really dominated, you know, throughout Sparks' history. This is a picture of a couple houses that were moved from, from Wadsworth and a couple neighbors um, staying around. But the thing that, that I put this picture in the, in the slide that really struck me was, look at the size of that dog. That is a huge dog. I don't know what the story is behind that, but. Um, so the name Sparks, you know, I, I think our friends in Reno, they like to make the joke that Reno's so close to hell it can see Sparks. Um, <laughs> we don't really subscribe to that at the Sparks Heritage Museum, but really the name Sparks came from, um, it, was, it was quite of a history to get to that point. Originally they were gonna name the town Glendale, but they decided that that would be too confusing with Glendale, California. Um, then another name that came up was New Wadsworth, and that one really didn't stick. No one really liked that. Another name that was thrown out was East Reno, and that was not accepted at all from, 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 from Sparks. Another name that did gain a little bit of traction um, was Harriman. They were going to name the town after the superintendent of the Southern Pacific Railroad, Edward Harriman, who was a, a big, my, a big uh, railroad tycoon of his day, um, but he respectfully declined the offer. He didn't want didn't want the new town. And so Sparks is a company town. When the railroad superintendent tells you to do something, you do, you do it. And so at the time, Sparks was going through the process with the Nevada legislature to create or, or become a city. And so the legislation was going through, and the governor at the time was John Sparks. And he was very popular. He was known as Honest John. He was, a, uh, he was Nevada's ninth governor, but he was also a, a cattle baron and had mining interests and was, was pretty popular. So the town got together and they chose Sparks as the name. And when, when the town with charter was approved on uh, March 15th, 1905, um, a, a couple days later, there was a big celebration out at um, Governor Sparks' Alamo Ranch, which was located where the Reno Sparks Convention Center and, and the Atlantis is, is today. And he had the whole town over for, for a barbecue. And so Sparks today, it's a little over 808,000. I'd love to see, I think Governor Sparks would probably need some more food to accommodate the town today for a celebration. So for the first 50 years of Sparks' history, the railroad really dominated all aspects of the life, social, political, economic, of, of course. It was a company town, and, um, and, and, it was a re, and it was a key division point along the railroad, and it still is today. You know, all of the supplies coming from the Port of Oakland and San Francisco and heading east and supplies heading east and going, going that way. Sparks was really the big stop, was the last stop for maintenance over the, the, um, the Sierra Pass. And um, during both world wars, the Sparks, um, uh, the Sparks rail yard here did play a very important role within the, within the, the war effort. The, the first building I want to talk about tonight is um, historically known as the Sparks Justice Court and the Sparks Library. It's located at 814 Victorian Avenue. That's at the corner of Pyramid Way and Victorian Avenue today. It's, um, it was built in 1931, and it was one of the first government buildings in Sparks. And the downstairs of the, of the building was where the Sparks Justice Court was located, and the upstairs was where the, uh, the library was. Um, this building was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1992, and it was designed by Frederick DeLongchamps, who is Nevada's preeminent architect. It's designed, I think, pretty much every county courthouse or building of substance. Um, very, um, very important architect in our state's history. But since 1981, this building has been home to the Sparks Heritage Museum. 
And that, that's where we are today. And so I wouldn't be doing my job as a lifetime member of the, of the museum and a member of the board if I didn't put in a quick plug for the Sparks Heritage Museum. Um, there's basic, you know, if you haven't come down and, and, and checked us out, please check, a, check, check us out. Um, sparksmuseum.org is our, is our website. We have um, a great gallery of permanent exhibits and changing exhibits. And upstairs, we have a cultural center where we do artwork all throughout the, the year. And then downstairs, we're, right now, we're working on a, a research library um, to help kind of provide this, the services. But there's three ways that, that you can support us. The, um, one way is to come down, check us out at Mission Fees, help keep the lights on, keep us going and doing what we do. The second way, and I think this is the best way, um, is to become a member of the Sparks Heritage Museum. We have membership is available to anyone and everyone in the, in the community, and the, and the proceeds from memberships go to help support us. And the last way, um, if you're interested, is, is we'll, we'll take your money or we'll take your time. We're always in need of volunteers um, to help um, keep the, run the front desk, give tours of the exhibits, give tours of the trains. Um, but please come check us out down at the Sparks Heritage Museum. Now this was um, after uh, after a few a few years, the town really got its its legs up underneath it, and the commercial core kind of evolved from serving primarily the railroad um, operations and those traveling through to becoming its own commercial core and serving the community and, and also people in, in Reno too. Um, this is an early photo of, of B Streets now known as Victorian Avenue, but this was really the main the main stretch through 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 town. Um, it was a very important business area. This is a shot inside Hale's Drugstore. And that is, today we have, that's our museum annex building. We have a lot of our permanent collections in there too, but it was a drugstore. And I just love the photo here. It just kind of shows what life was like. This was where, you know, you, you got your groceries, you got your shoes, you know, you, you went out to dinner. It was, it, was, it was the place to be. And just a great shot. And I'm not sure what's going on on, on the corner here with the two young ladies kind of with these demented look. Um, and, and if you kind of zoom in a little bit closer, they're selling devil dogs. And so, I, so they might probably need to look, I don't know, it's close to Halloween. I thought it was just a fun picture to show. Um, as I mentioned before, this was the main stretch through, through the area. And in 1913, the Lincoln Highway came through along, along B Street. And as automobiles became more popular, uh, more, more um, better roads were built and more people began traveling through the area and that certainly helped out this um, th this district in the late 30s and into the 40s um, the lincoln highway was replaced by us 40 route us 40 which was the main highway through the area and that brought even more traffic and more more business through and this is a great postcard um, kind of showing what what the area was was looking like and as, and as people got out and, and explored, particularly after World War, World War II, they got out and explored in their, in their new cars. There were new businesses like drive throughs and um, all, all sorts of stuff. You know, there, was, there was a lot of competition to get people's attention. And one of the ways to do that was with these roadside attractions. And Sparks' big road, roadside attraction, really an icon of the community, is Last Chance Joe. Last Chance Joe was originally installed in front of the Nugget um, in 1958, and he had greeted customers um, and, and visitors through Sparks for over 56 years. He arrived by train um, to the town in three different sections, but he was, he was built by R.H. Gross Scenic Studios out of Los Angeles, and they were really famous for doing the original work at the Disneyland theme park in Southern California. And, and Joe, he was a big part of the Nuggets uh, marketing campaign, I think the, 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 all the nuggets around, around the West. Um, and, and you kind of see a promotional shot here of Joe dressed up as Santa Claus with birth of the elephant out there. But he was actually, he had his own memorabilia that was, that was created and it was, was, was really an icon in the community. And I like to think, um, you know, and I'm not sure what it is about um, cowboys and miners and casinos in Nevada, but I think there's, there's Joe probably has some relatives. I, I, I like to think that he's relative. Um, perhaps Joe's closest relative would be the giant prospector here in the bottom bottom corner. He's in front of the Nugget ca uh, Candy Factory there in Washoe Valley. But he was originally in front um, in, on the top of, this, of the main entrance to the Gold, Gold Strike or Gold Claim Casino. 
And that was located on the other side of B Street um, across from Last Chance Joe. So I like to think that they're maybe half brothers. Um, and also, you know, I, I'd like to think that Joe's a, a close relative or distant relative to River Rick down in Laughlin, Vegas Vic and Vegas Vicky and on Fremont Street in Las Vegas. And of course, Wendover Will out in, out in the West Wendover. Now in, in, 19, or in 2014, the new owners of the Nugget um, decided to make some renovations to the exterior to the building and they decided to donate Last Chance Joe to, to the city and the museum. And that really kick started a whole big community effort to move Last Chance Joe to his new location in front of the museum. And um, in 2015, in December of 2015, the big move was, was made possible through a lot of great donations and a lot of hard work from the City of Sparks, Q&D Construction, Baldini's Casino. We had a big donation from an anonymous donor. And then of course, Senator, State Senator Julie Radia. Julie Raddy um, was a huge part of it too. And so we moved him to, from the north side, he was for 56 years, he faced the north side of, of B Street. And, um, and then we moved him to, and he's now facing the south side. And so that created a lot of issues because it kind of, we have a lot of sun here in, in Nevada. And so we had to, fancy paint, but he's out front looking good. And um, we're always looking, the funds are definitely needed to help with his maintenance and, and keep him looking good. So the, um, check out our website or, or the donations are also accepted through the Community Foundation of Western Nevada. The next building I wanna talk about um, tonight is what's known today as the Great Basin Brewery Building. Um, this building is um, probably pretty, is, is pretty famous today but it was originally um, at this location, there was a, there was a two story building um, that was built in the 1920s that housed the Reynolds Theater. And the Reynolds Theater was really the first movie theater in Sparks and also housed productions. And in 1946, um, a gentleman by the name of Robert Baker, who was a very prominent businessman in Sparks, particularly in this district, he had he had a grocery store, he had a furniture store, he had a hardware store. 1946, he bought the, the, the Reynolds building and built, and in 1952, he built the current structure that, that's located there. And this is a shot during a parade of the, the Great Basin, um, what's now known as the Great Basin Brewery Building. He operated the furniture store and a hardware store in this location up until the late 1980s. And in the late 1980s, it was turned into um, an antique mall, mini mall that was called Roundhouse Square. And that's when it underwent its, what I call its Victorianization. And that's kind of its, its Victorian um, facade and what it looks like today. This is a, a photo of the owners of the Great Basin, um, Tom and Bonda Young. In 1993, they moved into um, the Roundhouse Square and they opened up the Great Basin Brewery building. And um, in 2014, they brewed their one millionth bottle of beer. And I think it's just a great success story. And I read over, um, over the weekend that they recently sold the business and they're kind of gonna move on to their next adventure. But I always like to put a, a shout out to the Great Basin and Tom and Bonda. They've been such great supporters to the Sparks Heritage Museum. And uh, it's just a real success story, I, I think, to open up a business. Um, Cause Sparks in 1993 was a lot different than it is today. And Victorian Square was, was a lot different than it was. And just a great success story. Now, a lot of people ask, um, I brought up the Victorianization, and a lot of people ask, well, what's the deal with Victorian Square? You know, obviously, Sparks became a city in 1905 that was well after the Victorian age. You know, it's traditionally known as the rail city, so what's, what's the deal with this, with this Victorian theme? And, you know, obviously, downtown Sparks has always been the home for special events. This is a shot, I think this is in the 20s, of a motorcycle race. And they were, it was started right in front of the Bank of Sparks and W.R. Adams and Son um, Jeweler. But it was where everyone came down um, for, for any sort of gathering or it was the kickstart of any sort of special event. Another um, prominent special event, and it's still going on today, is Jack's Carnival. And Jack's Carnival is a fundraiser for Robert Mitchell Elementary School. Um, but this is a great shot of, of the kids. What they would do is they would dress up as nursery rhyme characters. And then they would, they would have a parade from the school down to downtown Sparks, and they would be a big carnival with, with games, and they would raise money um, for, for the school. And this, was, and, you know, and this was also a gathering place for Labor Day. Labor Day, is a, as Sparks is a company railroad town, Labor Day was very important. 
It's also very important today because you know that's when the rib cook-off is. That's one of my favorite events, but um, other events that went on, you know, Fourth of July celebrations and really parades, any kind of kind of gathering. And so um, you saw the the photo here where the kids were marching. This is where they were marching to. This was the bandstand, and this is on the south end of what is 10th Street and Victorian Avenue today. It's basically where the amphitheater is, the Tony Armstrong Memorial Amphitheater um, in, in downtown. But the, originally there was a bandstand. And this was where you know, everyone would get together and they would, they would have these great gatherings. Um, in fact, President Truman, when he was coming through campaigning in, in, in the area during his term in office, he, he did a speech from, from this bandstand. This is a shot um, in this, um, for the Sparks folks out there, this, the, the kid running is former Councilman John Mayer. And, and he had a family, family member that lived um, on, the, on the south end of, of the, in a neighborhood called the Reserve here. But kind of getting back to ultimately the question about what, what, what's the deal with, with the Victorian Square? Where did, it, where did it come from? Sparks in 1977 took advantage of the state's um, newly created law that, that, that enabled redevelopment agencies. Towards the 1970s, this area really become run down. The city wanted to do something. And so they got the group of businesses together with, with city leaders and they formed this, this redevelopment agency. And, and, and they did look at, in the, in the early 1980s, well, let's, let's do a railroad theme. But they just couldn't get everybody to agree. It was hard enough for everybody to, to come together and form the redevelopment agency. They didn't want everyone to, they didn't want more fighting on it. They just couldn't agree with it. Ultimately what happened, you know, this is the late 70s, early 80s, and in that time, um, Victorian landscaping was really popular. And there was a town on the northwest, on the, on the coast of Oregon, that had done a, a, a Victorian theme for its redevelopment project. And so the group from Sparks went up and toured this town, and everybody loved it, and more importantly, everyone agreed on it. And so that's what they chose, and that and it was the only thing they could really just, just agree on. And I think over the years, it's, it's helped give the area an identity. It's really helped with the rise of special events. I mentioned the rib cook-off with hot August nights. We have the Sparks Hometown Christmas Parade, um, and, you know, just at 4th of July. And then even with um, the new Nugget Event Center, you know, this has been known as a real premier um, cultural and um, special events venue here. The next building I wanted to talk about is W.R. Adams and Son. Um, originally, there was a two-story building here that was known as the Butler Building. And um, that was, and in 1937, W.R. Adams had purchased the land and built the current building. This is a shot, I think this is the 1950s of W.R. Adams. It's, it's, the, it's the black building right there in the middle. But W.R. Adams and Son for a long time was the premier jeweler. It was where you got your engagement ring. It's where you, you, you took your jewelry to get, to get, to get cleaned up. And um, they were in operation from 1915 all the way up until 2015. It was a family owned business. And so here's a shot of the inside of, of W.R. Adams and Son. The gentleman on the left is W.R. Adams and the guy on the left, um, or the guy on the right is, yeah, it's not W.R. Adams, but <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the great stories that I'm um, doing research on this on this on this tour is um, during World War II, W.R. Adams and Son had the contract with the railroad to maintain the stopwatches that all of the brakemen and railroad workers had used, and um, and that if you can think, and during World War II, without the internet and telephones and all of that stuff, if you're running trains for the war effort, it was pretty important that you were on time. And so we like to think that W.R. Adams and Son Jeweler with them maintaining the stopwatches played a really important role with the, with the railroad and, and the war effort with everything that was, was coming through. W.R. Adams and Son, he, uh, or W.R. Adams, he served as the mayor of Sparks from 1931 to 1935. Here's an um, earlier kind of streetscape photo here. But um, I mentioned before in 2015, Marsha Adams, she had decided to retire after 100 years of the family being in business. And she's a great supporter of the Sparks Heritage Museum. And, we, and in fact, when the business closed, um, they donated the display cases, which we use to house some of our exhibits at, at the museum. Now the next building, and this is my favorite building in, um, in this area and in all of Sparks really, and that's the Bank of Sparks building. 
This is the oldest um, commercial building that we have left in Sparks, one of the oldest buildings we have in Sparks, period. And it's probably the best example we have left of what earliest 20th century commercial architecture looked like in Sparks. This building was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2007. The style of this building is what they call a Romanesque revival. And that's evidenced by the use of the, the stone and, and the brick. Um, other famous examples of Romanesque revival is the uh, Smithsonian Capitol in, or Castle in Washington, D.C. And then a really good example here in Carson City across the street is the Paul Laxalt State Building. The Romanesque revival style was really built for to show prominence and to show permanence. And so they used it in things like banks and government, government buildings. The Bank of Stark, Sparks was, was founded on October 12th, 1904 with a capital of $2,500. The first officers were President Walter Harris, Vice President Richard Kerman, who was later Nevada's 16th governor and also served as mayor of Reno, and, Walt, and William McMillan, who was later state treasurer. Now this was the bank for Sparks. It was where all the railroad workers went to cash their, their checks. It was where all the merchants did loans and did their business. It's where the city of Sparks and the Sparks School District had its, had its money. It was really the bedrock of the community. In 1920, the, the Bank of Sparks was, a, was acquired by um, George Wingfield. George Wingfield, very important person in Nevada history, very powerful and prominent person in Nevada history. He was, a lot of historians call him as the owner of, of Nevada. And um, he had a lot of influence. He had mining interests and gaming interests and ranching interests and was a very important political player as, as well too. He also has a unique tie to Sparks um, out in the Spanish Springs Valley. He purchased a ranch that he used as kind of a retreat for all of his political and business gatherings. And that was later developed into the master plan community of Wingfield Springs. And so under um, Wingfield's ownership in the roaring 20s, um, he tried to modernize the bank and made a lot of crazy financial decisions like anyone else did. And so um, when the crash happened, um, a lot, it, it, it really did a, uh, it, its number on the bank and the finances. Ultimately, in 1932, the bank closed, and that costed all of the depositors about 35% of their money. Um, even worse, it forced everyone to go all the way over to Reno to, to, do, their, to do the banking. Sparks did not have a bank for three years. And I mentioned, you know, everyone lost 35% of its money, but that had a huge impact on the city and the school district. They lost their money as well, too. So they had to lay off teachers and they had to lay off city workers. This was at the height of the depression. It was, it was not good. And, you know, one of the sad stories that we have is the Sparks High School graduating class in 1933. They lost all of their money in, in the crash, too. And so there's not a Sparks High School yearbook for the year 1933. So the city and the Sparks Lions Club got together in 1934 and worked together to bring a bank back. And by 1935, the first national bank opened up in this location. And it served in this location for up until 1950 when it moved across 10th Street to where the Silver Club was, or where the Nugget Event Center is today. Um, basically, they moved out of this location because they needed a drive through. And um, when, the, when the Silver Club was actually built in the late 70s, early 80s, they, um, they used the old bank vault from the First National Bank building as the casino um, cashier cage. Kind of an interesting story there. Um, another really interesting story um, that, that came up in the course of doing research of this was in 1925, there was a, there was a major bank robbery. On March 3rd, in the early morning hours of March 31st, 1925, a masked man with a gun came into the Bank of Sparks and ordered all the employees into the vault. After locking them into the vault, he went and proceeded to open up the safety deposit boxes and the cashier's um, things and walked away you know, in an hour with $32,000. He then whisked off into the, into the daylight, never to be seen again. Um, a few months later in, in, in July, the Washoe County Sheriff tracked him down in Goldfield. And he arrested an individual by the name of Dudley M. Boyle. And he was brought back to trial. And in September, it was kind of kickstart of a big, prominent trial in, in, the, in the area. And so during the course of that trial, and Dudley M. Boyle was actually represented by a young lawyer by the name of Patrick McCarran. And during the, during the, the, the trial, it was discovered that the keys that he had were, were copies of keys that were made by a former bank employee by the name of Jake Lute Smith. So he had an accomplice. And, um, just a you know fascinating story. 
you know, Sparks is a very patriotic town. And during World War II, just to put it in perspective, the population of Sparks was only 6,200 people. But despite that, they were able to raise over $600,000 to help through these various war, war bond drives. And um, the monies that were deposited and, and collected were actually done at the Bank of Sparks building. And the employees that, of the First National Bank, they stayed open late to help support the war effort. But just to put it in perspective, $600,000 during World War II, that's roughly $8.1 million in today's money um, to help support. And it was such a big success that the Boeing, Air, um, the Boeing company decided to name a B-25J bomber the Spirit of Sparks in honor of, of, of the town and its patriotism and its, and its efforts towards, towards the war. Here's a picture of the Spirit of Sparks with her crew. Um, it served in the European theater of the war, and between 1944 and 1945, it was part of the 321st Bomb Squadron and flew over 150 missions over southern Europe and in, and in, and in Italy. Um, unfortunately, um, when it was coming back from a, a, a mission, it was landing at its base in, in Italy, and it hit a power line and, um, at the end of the runway and crash landed. Everyone was safe. There was never anybody ever killed. Um, in, in any of these missions, but unfortunately, the, the Spirit of Sparks plane was, was ultimately scrapped. But just a really cool legacy project that we, ha we actually have a model of the Spirit of Sparks in, in, our, in our collections. Here's another photo of, of, of the, the Bank of Sparks. You know, just a great building, really prominent. I don't know what it was. There was an early photo that I showed you, the Bank of Sparks. But I think what they used to do is, this was a manager of the Bank of Sparks. I think what they used to do is they had made the manager, whenever he got, got named the manager, he had to go in front and take a picture in front of the, in front of the, the, the front door there and lean it up against it. But just a great building. Um, the building behind it, too, is also pretty historic. Now in the 1950s and 1960s, Sparks really started to grow outwards and there was a lot of new neighborhoods that were, that were built. And with all these new neighborhoods, there were, there were families and kids that, that, that were moving into the community. And so um, Harry Foote decided, looking at all this residential growth, to open up a children's clothing store that was called the Carousel Shop. The Carousel Shop operated in the building behind the, the Bank of Sparks from 1955 to 1974. One of the... Um, his daughter, Margie Foote, operated the carousel shop, and there's a lot of great memories of, of, of her and, 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 and all the, it was basically where you went to get your clothes if you were a kid in Sparks during, the, during those areas. But Margie Foote, uh, the late Margie Foote, she served four terms in the Nevada State Assembly for Sparks from 1967 to 1975 and served one term in the State Senate. Um, I had the great pleasure of working with Margie and her family in 2007 um, working on the Bank of Sparks nomination, and just a big credit to her and her family, um, keeping the building up and running and, and allowing it to be um, part of the city's history. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier, the south side of this business district, you can kind of see on the left-hand side here, the, the three columns, that's the Great Basin Brewery building. But so on the north side was commercial, on the south side was residential. It was a neighborhood called the Reserve. But in the middle, there was this really cool parkway. And this is where people gathered for events and, and got together. And Sparks is really unique in that it's downtown only had commercial on one side. But as um, things changed in the 1960s, oh, here's another great shot of um, some folks on, at, a, at a picnic table enjoying downtown Sparks. But in 1957, um, the railroad really scaled back its operations. In those days, the, the diesel locomotive was really kind of taking over um, within the railroad. And so there was a lot less employees that were needed. And um, so the railroad really scaled back its, its operations. And so this forced the closure of the Roundhouse building. And in 1957, it was ultimately demolished. Now, the Roundhouse, it was located roughly where the intersection of um, Pyramid Way and I-80 is, is today, and it was just a cool building that's no longer there. But this, this shift really shifted the economy. Sparks was a railroad town and a company town, and so the 1950s, late 1950s into the 60s, it became more of a tourism and the rise of the nugget with, with all the casinos, and also the rise of industrial and, and commercial development as well, too. Um, also in the 60s, there was the construction of Interstate 80. In 1966, Interstate 80 was completed in Sparks. This is a shot of them building um, Interstate 80 through Sparks. This is a little bit west of where we were 
earlier, but it's basically where it goes over the Nugget Casino today. And those of you who have been stuck in traffic in Sparks, you just wish they could have added four or more lanes to get through that, that section of, of the freeway. Um, but this really, um, the, the, the rise of the, or the, the, the construction of, of Interstate 80 really changed the economy and um, got rid of all that traffic that was flowing through downtown Sparks. That combined with um, all of the new development that was going on to the north and the, the nugget taking out and, and expanding, that basically took out the reserve neighborhood. Um, the, the, it was I-80 was, was that. But anyway, um, so towards the, the late 70s, the city was, was really starting to, was concerned about what was happening in downtown Sparks. And these businesses really weren't competing with, with the new shopping malls and new Green Bray shopping centers and Audi Boulevard commercial stuff. And so they decided to, to do something. And one of the things that they decided to do early on in the creation of the redevelopment agency was to do history. And one of the first projects that they did was, um, was to bring back the, uh, the Glendale Schoolhouse. Now, the Glendale Schoolhouse it is built, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. It's believed to be the oldest remaining schoolhouse in the state of Nevada. And it was an actual school from 1864 all the way up until 1958. Um, in, the, in the 70s, they moved it to the, where the Reno Sparks Convention Center was. But in 1993, they decided to move the city and the Sparks Sertoma Club decided to move it back to Sparks or, or Glendale soil. Here's an early shot from my friend, um, Neil Cobb, um, of a big gathering at the, at the Glendale Schoolhouse. But for a long time, this was the only school in, in the area. And um, one of the prominent, uh, probably the most prominent student to attend the Glendale Schoolhouse was Patrick McCarran. Patrick McCarran later became Senator Patrick McCarran, one of the most important figures in, in Nevada history. Um, I don't think it's a stretch to say he was controversial in his era or in today's era, but for good and bad, he's a very important figure in, in our state's history. He served as the, long, as the longtime chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and had a big impact, which was um, important for a small state like, like Nevada, but he actually got his start and his formal early training at, at the Glendale Schoolhouse. Another really unique story um, with the Glendale Schoolhouse is its connection with um, Bertha Refretto. Bertha Refretto was a teacher at the Glendale Schoolhouse early on, and, in, um, and she was most famous for writing our state song, Home Means Nevada which became the state song in 1933. Um, we like to think that there's a connection um, between, Glenn, between Bertha's time at the Glendale Schoolhouse and the state song. You know, there's the chorus, the line in the chorus of the state song, out by the Truckee Silvery Rills, out where the sun always shines. That would have been in the backyard of this Glendale Schoolhouse. It was located, those silvery rills of the Truckee River were right, right behind it. And so kind of a fun, fun connection with really historic building. Another project that the city kicked off was the creation of um, James Lillard Railroad Park. James Lillard was a former mayor of Sparks and was mayor of Sparks during the bicentennial celebration in 1976. Um, originally, our train museum in Lillard Park was located at 15th Street in, in, in Victoria, and that's where the RTC Transit bus station is, is today. Um, but this project was built by the Sparks, City of Sparks Bicentennial Commission and they had the honor, a really big effort, but they were honored by being one of the top three bicentennial cities in all of America for bicentennial celebration. The, uh, the, the train museum includes the Engine 8, um, which is on loan to the city of Sparks from the Nevada State Railroad Museum. I don't know what you call it when it's been on loan for roughly 50 years, but um, it, it, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> And so it also, it, the museum also included a half-size replica of the original Sparks um, Railroad Depot, and also includes a caboose and, a, and an executive car. In 1981, they moved the trains and the depot to its present location right across the street from the Sparks Heritage Museum. Another feature in, in Lillard Railroad Park is the Chinese historical marker for the um, Chinese railroad workers. Um, in 1964, in honor of Nevada's centennial, um, the city of Sparks commissioned a, uh, a special marker to honor the Chinese railroad workers who built the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, the Chinese railroad workers, you know, they experienced a lot of hardships, both on the, on the job site and off the job site. And for a long time, well, this was the first, and for a long time, it was the only memorial 
in the, in the country in honor of the Chinese railroad workers. During the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, and these are some folks building the um, segment through the East Truckee Canyon, they, the Chinese railroad workers comprised roughly four-fifths of the labor force. And, um, and they did all the hard jobs, you know, the, the jobs that nobody really wanted, wanted to do. So this, this monument that we have there in the park really honors them. One side of it's in Chinese, the other side of it's in, in, in English. The last feature in the Lillard Railroad Park and the last stop on, on this virtual tour here is, is, a, is an actual piece of the Transcontinental Railroad. This is a bridge of the Transcontinental Railroad that, that was relocated here in 2004. This bridge was originally located near the intersection of what's now Prater Way and um, McCarran Boulevard. And it was moved to, to Lillard Park to kind of, and we believe that it was built, probably likely built in, um, by Chinese railroad, railroad, railroad workers. Um, in, in conclusion, my, I just wanted to take a moment to honor my late friend, Fred Horlacher, who um, was a longtime member of the Sparks Heritage Museum. And I served with him on the, um, the board. He passed away earlier this, this month. And um, Fred was an award-winning educator and taught generations of, of Nevadans. And um, he was named Washoe County Teacher of the Year in 1984 and State of Nevada Teacher in 1985. Um, many of you may have, may have known, known Fred or heard of Fred or maybe been on one of his, his tours, but I wanted to just dedicate tonight's talk in honor, in honor of Fred. And so with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I sure can. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, eight eight fourteen Victorian Avenue, and that's at the um, it's the northwest corner of um, Pyramid Way and Victorian, and it's it's the big brown or big brick building. Right there, sparksmuseum.org is our is our uh, website. Please come check us out. Yeah, thank thank you for that question. Um, oh yeah, uh, the, the question was was how did John Esquaga come come to Sparks, and, and I appreciate the question because over the over the summer, John John Esquaga had passed has passed away. Um, but, 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 but what a life. Um, it's my understanding he came from Idaho with Dick Graves. And in 1955, Dick Graves opened up the Nugget Coffee Shop on the north side of, of, of Victorian. And John Esquaga got his start working for Dick Graves in the coffee shop. And then ultimately, I, I want to say in like 1958 or so, he, perched, he was able to purchase the, the Nugget through a handshake agreement with Dick Graves. And then the rest is, is really history. He built the first tower in the mid 80s and in 1996 built the built the West Tower. And I think that's just a really American story. You know, a, a bass kid from from Idaho comes to Nevada and builds one of the largest resort casinos in all the country. OK. Cool. All right. Thank you very much.